Hamstring tears are one of the most common injuries among athletes, but that doesn't ease the pain. However, Jackie Munro can see a positive out of hers. If it had to happen, at least it's now and not closer to the Olympics. It's allowed me a lot of time to get back into it and I can recover and take my time recovering and not push to get back in and try and come back too early and maybe tear it again. The national champion tore her hamstring during a Grand Prix meet in Canberra earlier this month and will miss at least the next two, although she expects to be back on track for the coming state and national championships later this month, it's repairs to confidence that may be her biggest hurdle. I don't want to go into racing and think, oh no, am I going to do it again or should I run a bit careful? I mean, I want to be able to be strong in my race and not have to worry about it. The 18-year-old plans to head to South Africa in March before competing in Japan, but it's her Australian 100 metre hurdles crown Munro desperately wants to defend at the end of the month, and she's giving herself every chance to be ready. I've been training more now, like with pool sessions and things like that, than I have been um, when I was running well and not injured. So. Olympic qualifiers are in August. Jim Callanan, NBN News. To some, it's just a flutter on the pokies, but we all know how easy it is to get hooked. As uh, stress increases in our community, people try the fast fix of perhaps getting money through gambling, and for many people that just worsens the problem. The state government, though, is now betting on a new plan to get those addicted back on track, and it's using a small portion of the more than $1.2 billion injected into our state's economy from gambling to help solve the problem. In the Hunter alone, more than $160,000 from the Casino Community Fund will go towards programs over the next 12 months. 
over $45,000 to life activities and uh, 26 plus to the city mission for two ongoing programs up to the half year and then money going to two to five theatre. The biggest portion, however, has been set aside for the Newcastle Salvation Army. Its $80,000 grant will go towards employing a full-time counsellor for problem gamblers and their families. Clubs are also getting behind the initiative, sponsoring staff to attend programs which may help them prevent customers from taking their addiction too far. Helen Kapalos, MBN News. Last night, supporters arrived early to help save a hospital which staff say is failing everybody. It's made more and more difficult every day. The conditions that we work in are really substandard. And is it putting patients' lives at risk or not? Not yet, but uh, it could soon. That's our worry. At the rally, a video showed patients in corridors, overcrowding and a lack of privacy. Professor David Henry lamented that empty beds sit behind chain doors at the Mater. The demands, increased public funding for the MARTA, reopening of beds closed last year, services to be increased and a government commitment to redevelopment. The head of Hunter Health did not speak at the meeting, but the message for her was clear. Today, Professor McGrath met with her board. She says it's determined to complete a plan which will see $200 million worth of capital improvements to Hunter Health. $70 million of those are earmarked for the MARTA, but the funding is to be paid for by a not-for-profit partner. Professor McGrath won't be going to the government for extra money and wants those campaigning for separate public funding for the MARTA to stop and help the implementation of Hunter Health's plan. Why should I go to government and say, give me $80 million and we'll forget about it and, and we'll let them forget the rest? We want the total package. It seems a contradiction to say the hunter is on the verge of a jobs boom when our unemployment rate is one of the state's highest and on the rise. But economists say that doesn't matter. Even with the increase in interest rates and with the impact of GST, we do, we do see that growth continuing over this year. Behind the optimistic outlook is a recent surge in consumer confidence and a new influx of people looking for work with a high success rate. In fact, the figures reveal the hunter has more people in a job than ever before, with more than 260,000 people now in full-time work. But there's no doubt there's testing times ahead, with the retrenchment of BHP and more recently national textile workers still to be factored in. The fact that our unemployment is still so high is a clear indication that there are groups in the community who are not sharing that economic growth. And there are calls too from those outside the region claiming the area has to market its strong qualities to potential investors. In the US there's a lot of t um, places the size of Newcastle who are attracting investment and, and quite large um, technology firms because they have all of those uh, lifestyle population um, demographics that um, those sorts of companies want. Helen Kapalos, MBN News.
it's a well-known fact that Sydney real estate is virtually out of reach for those on average incomes. It seems the high cost of living is behind a modest but growing inflation rate. The trigger this week for the Reserve Bank quickly followed by the major banks to bump up official rates by half a percent. A Newcastle University academic believes it will now be regional areas that pay the highest price. Well, this is the problem. Um, the federal government, and indeed now with the Reserve Bank uh, hiking interest rates, they don't seem capable of realising that different policies are suitable for different areas. Dr Watts says inflation in all capital cities has painted an inaccurate picture of the national economy and as usual it will be country home and property buyers left to play catch up. The key to long term um, improvement in living standards and jobs is investment and unfortunately investment is not going to be encouraged in a climate of higher interest rates. And higher interest means slower jobs growth, which will be especially tough on country areas still struggling to attract investment dollars and new opportunities. Helen Kapalos, MBN News. Trying to make the most of flat surf conditions today, 14 life-saving clubs gathered at Copacabana Beach to find out which club is the best. Last year it was Umina who took out the honours and this year they did it again. But it wasn't without a challenge, several of the coast's other clubs nipping at their heels to claim the prestigious title. Meanwhile at Avoca Beach the longboard surfing enthusiasts also battled the small surf to try to take out round nine of the Longboard Legends series. We've had very average conditions unfortunately. The surf's in the three foot range but uh, the banks aren't working properly. We're hoping for better conditions tomorrow for the semi-finals and the finals. It's only the second year the event has run but already it's attracted more than 60 competitors and could even earn some riders a spot on the Australian team. We'll be part of the Australian longboard circuit for the professionals and that is used to pick the team to represent Australia at the next world titles. Surfing continues tomorrow with the professional division taking to the water around midday. Adam Harper, NBN News. With their game plans finalised and hard training sessions finished for the week, the Northern Eagles spent today fine-tuning their skills and taking it easy. So very hot here today and we're expecting another hot one tomorrow, so um, plenty of indoors I think uh, today and tomorrow and plenty of rest uh, for the big game. But not everything has been decided. It's still unclear whether Brett Grogan will make the starting lineup for centre. Whoever makes the cut will be facing a tough game, despite some injuries to several key Knights players. I think we've got a very talented side and I think it's the best time to play in Newcastle. They've got Matty, Joey and um, Gidzi haven't played a game yet, so their time could be like a, a touch-off sort of thing. And We've had a couple of trial matches and we've performed quite well, so we're, um, we're pretty confident going into the game, even though they are, I think they are the, the favourites for the competition. The sellout game begins at 8pm tomorrow night.
something that keeps you out of trouble, cops are always on your case about doing burnouts and that, we'll keep away from that, get the crowd into something else, something you don't get in trouble with all the time. Two crews from six countries are in Port Stephens for the biannual event that pits sailors from around the Pacific Rim against one another. Racing J24s, all crews are supplied craft on a rotational basis so that they don't race the same boat each time, making each race much more open. While strong winds damaged craft overnight, the first two of 12 races in the international event were able to be sailed today. And it was the Kiwis that set the early pace, ahead of one of the Australian crews. The opening race went to the Gary Capskip at New Zealand boat, beating the best local craft with Gary Sharp at the helm. To surfing, and Newcastle's Mark Hancock has taken the lead in the Longboard Legends Tour with one round remaining. The Nova Castrin beat Ian Bell from Port Macquarie in the penultimate round today on the Central Coast. After rolling the wolves, the breakers watched some waves, while Greg Owens continued to show he's the man to break any deadlock. Last night he fired home the match winner against Wollongong as Newcastle got back on the winning track. That's all we can hope for is come on and try and do your best, that's all we expect you to do and I've done it. And there was plenty to do after the wolves dominated the first half. Socceroo Scott Chipperfield slotting one home after just seven minutes. Shane Price returned serve, but the breakers couldn't crack the home side before the break, while keeper Bob Catlin had a hand on things at the back. More often than not, however, the Wolves made a meal of things when a goal was on offer. The match swung when Greg Owens came on. His pinpoint pass at John Bonavoglia bound for his eighth goal of the season and gave Newcastle an equaliser. In fact, all the substitutes played a role. Damien Smith almost gave Newcastle the lead with this. Bonavoglia and Owens both had shots blocked in another scramble in front of Wollongong's goal. The Wolves saved, but far from safe. This time fellow substitute Travis Dodd laid the trap, luring the Wolves away from Owens, who squeezed off the shot that killed the home side's chances. Newcastle 2-1 winners. Lee was hoping for seven points in the last four games, so we got that and we're up there in the equal third. We've just got to hold it now. While Andy Harper returns this week, Newcastle loses Vasco Trasemski, who scored his fourth booking and a one-week suspension.
barbecues along the picket line have become part of everyday life for many of the 350 sacked workers. Today they took their barbie to Sydney, setting up outside the waterfront mansion of National Textiles Director and brother of the Prime Minister, Stan Howard. With $11 million in entitlements hanging in the balance, the workers set up placards appealing to Mr Howard for help. Unlike his Prime Minister brother, who spent an hour with sacked workers last week, Stan was a no-show. Meantime, Maitland Mayor Peter Blackmore today launched a raffle of electrical goods designed to raise $10,000 for the sacked workers. He's hoping for a bipartisan solution to the problem. But this is not about politics, this is about humanity. And I'd like to see all sides of politics come together. We have Kim Beasley here on uh, tomorrow morning to address. I would like to see that we have the full support of the federal and state government. And retrenched worker Scott Osgar was given a new television set today after the boss of the Akai company saw a picture of him in a national newspaper hocking his old set at a pawnbroker. I had no money, I had no food. And TV was just sitting there and I said, oh well, you've got to go. Paul Lobb, NBN News. At the start of racing today off Middle Island, the J24s of Australia, New Zealand and the United States were quick off the mark. A 40 kilometre an hour southerly not only made sail handling difficult, the wind also whipped up a rough sea. As crews made their way from Soldiers Point across to the Dutchies Beach Boy, the Russians looked like they were walking on water. Canada tried to stay with the leaders while Japan struggled. Two crews from each of the six countries are taking part in the week-long regatta, most enjoying the warm Australian waters. These guys are, are, are really dedicated sailors. When you come from minus two degrees in Vladivostok to come over here and sail, you know, they, they must be doing something like that. After a fast downwind run under spinnakers, the mood turned sour for all crews except Australia 1, the fleet rounding the wrong buoy. The Aussie crew skippered by John Sharp was home and hosed, local knowledge paying dividends at the end of a difficult day sailing. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Damage estimated at $2 million destroyed the school in the early hours of the morning. Police say a man told a woman who lives alongside the school that he saw children in the grounds around the time of the fire. We'd asked this person to come forward. He's important for us to speak to to determine what time he was there and who we saw. And we'd like him to come forward to police with information. The man is described as being 45 to 50 with medium length grey hair. He's also short with a medium build. 
Two other fires started at the school in September and November are also being treated as suspicious. Police aren't necessarily drawing links between the three fires, though the fact that they all started early in the week at an isolated school in the small hours of the morning means the same person or people could be responsible for all three. We're after anyone that was in the, fire, in the area of the fires on those mornings to come forward. Today members of the Victoria Central Newcastle teams were back in the water after making waves at the weekend. Both the men's and women's side scored convincing wins in the state country championships on the Central Coast. Kim Van Husted has played a part in all of the 12 women's titles and isn't getting sick of winning. Definitely not. Every year there's new teams and new girls coming through. A lot of young girls that we haven't seen before so it's always you know, good to come away with a win. Both teams are performing so well they're certain to contribute plenty of players to a state country side which will contest the Australian Championships at Easter and their dominance could be set to continue with the game's local ranks growing. It's the oldest Olympic team sport and with the Olympics in Sydney this year there's a lot of junior interest and a lot of junior development going on especially in the Newcastle area. Since its release in September last year, the Koala Management Plan has divided the Port Stephens community. But today its authors hope to allay some of the confusion surrounding the document, which if accepted by Council will be an Australian first. We know that it can be a little bit tough, but just bear in mind that you're the only council in the whole of the country that's come this far and um, it's a, a terrific step ahead and quite historic really. And according to the peak organisation, the local koala population will face possible extinction if the present trend continues. The koala population in Port Stephens is so under threat that it makes me sad pretty much every day of my life. But this is a koala population that has a document that could save it. The idea of setting up sanctuaries to house the koala population was dismissed by the foundation. If people think that they can throw them into a small piece of land and put a fence around them and then charge tourists to come in, then not only are they diminishing the koala's sort of dignity, but you might as well just start a zoo. The plan, which is still on public display, will be discussed again tomorrow night by Council's Consultative Committee. Tanya Carlisle, NBN News. Way back in round three, the Breakers upset the Northern Spirit 2-0 at North Sydney Oval. It was a sign of things to come for both sides. Newcastle's now one of the league's front runners, while the Spirit season has been patchy at best. But the Breakers are still wary going into Friday's game. They've uh, got a lot of quality players. Uh, they've had some good results recently. And uh, if you take them lightly, that's when they punish you. They get a bit of confidence and get a roll on. While star striker Andy Harper will return from suspension, Vasco Trepchewski will be serving his. Lee Sterry is still undecided on who'll fill the vacancy in the starting 11, but it'll be between Tancheski, Smith, Dodd and an informed Greg Owens. Each have got claims in, in different ways for a spot, so uh, it'll boil down to tactics. Colin Baldwin, NBN News. The Clarendon Hotel has been described as the cornerstone of Council's $10 million civic redevelopment, which is why councillors had little room to move in approving its redevelopment, despite the addition of a new gaming lounge in the inner city premises. The Council, if it didn't accept this provision that we accepted last night, uh, it means that we haven't got a tenant, we haven't got a hotel perhaps, and uh, that's not what we wanted. We obviously want to see the Clarendon go ahead, 
because it will be a high quality boutique hotel. Also influencing the outcome is state government legislation which rules that hotels are automatically allowed to have a gaming lounge. And council probably won't complain about the fact that the council owned premises are expected to return ratepayers more than $100,000 in annual revenue. But the Lord Mayor says council has a very different stance on taverns near shopping centres, a view that will soon be reflected in the drafting of a new local environment plan. I believe the community are concerned about that aspect. It's not healthy where mum takes the kids shopping and puts them in a plaza somewhere and goes into a tavern and plays gaming machines. Helen Kapalos, MBN News. They can go in places where you can't get the road bike, uh, patrolling school grounds, cycleways like we are here, shopping centres and park parkland. Conditions were challenging at Port Stephens again today as crews from six countries battled for line honours. In a 40 kilometre an hour nor'easter, Australia too was quick off the mark with the United States following in its wake. The J-24 of Japan had its spinnaker set nicely downwind on the Salamander Bay course. But at times it was all skippers could do to hold on to their kites. At the downwind mark, New Zealand rounded the buoy tightly, getting the jump on Australia who rounded widely moments before, followed by the USA and then the Russians. But the race belonged to Australia. The USA was second, Canada third. Canada leads the point score by the barest of margins over New Zealand and Australia. The winner will be decided during the 12th and final race tomorrow. Paul Lobb, NBN News. The program is the brainchild of Lake Macquarie Council's Road Safety Officer Scott Pickering and will be trialled over the next 12 months. It involves training parents to take students through a four-week course on road safety, teaching them basic rules such as signalling as well as always wearing a helmet. Well of course the importance of safety helmets and other safety equipment like lights and fluorescent jackets is explained to children but the main uh, purpose of this training course is to train them in the skills to ride safely on the road. According to Mr Pickering it's all about encouraging children to be aware of the dangers so they can better take care of themselves while riding their bikes. Initial training is conducted off-road once they get to the required standard the training is completed on lightly trafficked roads near the school. So they, they get the realism uh, which helps them retain the knowledge much longer. The initiative has impressed the state government enough for it to provide funding. It's hoped other local schools will adopt the idea. Amanda Bolger, NBN News. More than 30 exhibitors have come to town to display their wares and teach about the art of relaxation. The festival is called Positive Change in the New Millennium and has attractions ranging from the simple and new to the old-fashioned. And if it all gets too much, there's always somewhere to put your feet up for a while. The festival wraps up on Sunday. Meanwhile, local artist Mark White will be displaying his latest comic-style works over the next few weeks, after the official opening of his Testing the Water exhibition today. White uses the environment as his theme and is trying to encourage people to be more mindful about how they treat it. 
The exhibition finishes on the 27th of this month. Adam Harper, NBN News. Thank <laughs> you.